Hello, and welcome to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's MIT S SDM Systems Thinking webinar series. My name is Lois Slavin. I'm the SDM Communications Director, and I will be your host for today. SDM stands for System Design and Management, which is an MIT master's program for mid-career professionals offered jointly by the MIT Sloan School of Management and the MIT School of Engineering. SDM provides an education that focuses on integrating the technical, business, and sociopolitical components of complex challenges using systems thinking. Graduates earn an MS in engineering and management from MIT. The webinar series features research conducted by SDM faculty, alumni, students, and industry partners. The series is designed to show viewers specific real-life examples uh, on how systems thinking is being applied across industries. Today's webinar, Best Practices for Water Use at Thermoelectric Facilities in Chile and Latin America will will be presented by two SDM alumni, Jorge Moreno and Donnie Holleschutz, who are co-founders of InnoDo, and they'll tell you more about that in their presentation. The third presenter is from industry. Her name is Carolina Gomez, and she works in the Chilean Ministry of Energy and has worked on the project to be discussed with both Donnie and uh, Jorge, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat. <clears throat> we'll have, <clears throat> excuse me, we will have uh, about 10 minutes at the end of their presentation for Q&A. Also, you will be sent a link to the recording and slides uh, in about a week as well as information on our next upcoming webinar. So with that, Jorge, Donnie, and Carolina, the microphone is now yours. Thanks, Luis, for this kind introduction. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes? OK, thank you. So we're very pleased to join the MIT SDM System Thinking webinar series today. We will present a work in which uh, we have been involved since uh, 2014. I am in Santiago, uh, Chile, with uh, Ms. Carolina Gomez, and Donny is on the line because he's right now in, in Mexico. Well, Donny and I met uh, when we were at the SDM program in 2011. Uh, we founded Inodu in 2013. Since 2014, we have uh, focused our work here in Chile. We also have been doing some work with clients in Colombia and the United States. At Inodu, we support different type of organizations in the energy value chains. Today, we will present a very interesting project that we have had the opportunity to develop with the Ministry of Energy and other relevant stakeholders here in, in Chile. Thermoelectric facilities accounted for nearly 40% of the electricity generated in Latin America in 2014 and are amongst the most important water users in the region. The use of water produces important impact such as impeachment and entrainment of water organisms, chemical release into the water, thermal pollution in the mixing zone, and water loss significant institutional and social challenges in the region are being provoked by withdrawal water with intakes from region's water points. In many cases, such challenges are being exacerbated by ambiguous or not existing regulation, intricate permitting processes, poor quality of environmental assessments, difficulties communicated impacts and mitigation commitments to the stakeholders and perceptions by local communities and permitting authorities. The emerging regional inst institutional and social challenges 
have spawned significant risks and difficulties for developers and other uh, and operators of uh, thermoelectric facilities, government agencies, and communities. So here we have the, the agenda for today's presentation. First, Carolina will present the social challenges created by water use in thermoelectric facilities. She also will summarize some policy and regulatory initiatives in Chile. Then I will enter into the specifics of water use of thermoelectric facilities in Chile, the key impacts addressed by the guide we developed and some general aspects regarding regulation. Finally, Donnie will present some analysis and insights we gathered during the guide definition process. He will also present some highlights of the guide and some key insights of our current work with the Fisheries Agency in Chile. So, Carolina, the mic is, is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jorge. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Well, my name is Carolina Gomez. I work in the Sustainable Development Division at the Ministry of Energy in Chile, and I was in charge of the study that Jorge and Doni will present soon. Before to go into the details about the study, I want to show you why was the Ministry of Energy interested in studying good practices for water use at thermoelectric plants. The challenge was the environmental impact on marine environment from the lack of technology, which minimized adverse environmental impacts and the operation of cooling water systems in the thermoelectric power plants. So you can see in the pictures some prawns and crabs there. This problem caused that a power plant in this area had to stop its operation with the impact on over, uh, on over the national electric system. So, a brief summary of associated policy and regulatory initiatives in Chile are the following. Our energy agenda established in 2014 in its number one pillar the Ministry of Energy will support the development of specific regulations and instruments for the sector in order to improve the environmental performance of energy projects. Specifically, one of the initiatives in this line is to develop studies which regulate withdrawal and discharge of the cooling water of thermoelectric power plants. After that, in 2015, the energy policy defined the vision of Chile's energy sector by the year 2050 is that of a reliable, inclusive, competitive, and sustainable energy sector. The energy policy defined four, four pillars to reach this vision. One of them, the pillar number three, pointed to an environmentally friendly energy. That means the energy infrastructure generates low environmental impact. These impacts should be first avoided, then mitigated, and finally compensated, considering energy development and its implications in air, land, marine, and inland water ecosystems. Well, in the above context, the Sustainable Development Division at the Ministry of Energy hired to INODU to develop the study Technical, Economic, Regulatory, and Environmental Analysis of Thermoelectric Power Plant Technologies and their Cooling System, this was in 2014. After that, in 2015, they developed the study proposal of environmental regulation for water use in thermoelectric power plants, cooling system, and other industrial processes that withdraw and discharge water. In 2015, the MIT SDM published an extract of the Inodus work in its magazine. So during the 2014 and 2015, we developed a participative process in different regions of Chile, not just in the capital, in order to have opinions and perceptions from different actors in society, like NGOs, private sector, government services, universities, international experts, between others. For example, in the, from the government services, we worked with the Ministry of the Environment, the Undersecretariat of Fisheries and Aquaculture, the Ministry of Economy, the Ministry of Public Works, the General Direction of the Maritime Territory and Merchant Marine, and the Superintendents of the Environment. 
from the private sector, the association of generators of Chile and the energy generating companies such as Colbún, Enel, ASGENER and ENGIE participated with us in the activities. Inside the Ministry of Energy, different divisions participated in workshops of the study. Of course, the Sustainable Development Division, the Legal Division, the Project Management Unit, and the Security and Energy Market Division. The representatives from North, Center, and South of Chile were the Energy Regional Ministerial Secretariat of Antofagasta, Atacama, Valparaíso, and Bio Bio. After all these participative processes, the results were two products. The first one, the guide with good practices for the use of cooling water at the molecular power plants. This guide is indicative. And the second and final product was a proposal of a compulsory regulation that we sent to the Undersecretariat of Fisheries and Aquaculture because they have the attributions to regulate through the fisheries law. The fisheries law has the objective of the conservation and sustainable use of a hydrobiological resource. Neither the Ministry of Energy nor the Ministry of Environment has the attributions to regulate this issue. Well, now Jorge will continue the presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Carolina. Um, so now we are going uh, to go into the specific of uh, water use in thermoelectric facilities in Chile. Water use in thermoelectric facilities depends on several factors, such as the capacity of the power plant, its efficiency, the, temper the temperature of the water used at the entrance point of the cooling process, the maximum temperature elevation allowed at the discharge, uh, and the type of cooling process. It's important to highlight that water use does not depend on the type of fuel used in the thermoelectric facility. The cooling process can be a one-through cooling system or a closed cycle cooling system, either wet or dry. The primary function of the cooling system is to maintain the back pressure of the steam turbine and maintain this pressure closer to the design requirements under changing environmental conditions. Different trade-offs and requirements must be considered when we select a cooling system for a specific plant. When we use a one-through cooling system or a cooling tower, the power plant requires significant amount of water. To reliably supply water to the facility, we use an intake system, which also have different protection systems or exclusion technologies to protect the condenser of the power plant. The design of the water intake system is a unique problem that depends on several factors. In addition, it's important to identify three types of water requirements associated with the operation of the power plant. First, water withdrawals from the water body. Second, water use in the cooling system. And water consumption. Water consumption refers to the water that is evaporated and does not return to the water body throughout the discharge system. So we are in front of a very complex problem with several design and operational trade-offs with complex interaction driven by techno-economic, environmental, social and environmental policies and social requirements. By social requirements, I mean facts and perceptions. This slide shows some factors that need to be considered to select a cooling system. For the selection and design of a water intake system, several other factors need to be addressed, and we highlighted such requirements in our project with the Ministry of Energy. So in 2014, a survey was conducted to calculate water withdrawals potential for the thermoelectric generation base in Chile. This figure summarizes some of the key findings. Approximately 99% of the water used in thermoelectric facilities come, comes from the Pacific Ocean, and less than 1% is withdrawn from water wells located inland. You can also see 
that an overhead siphon is the most common intake structure used in Chile. We found that 95% of the water withdrawal is used for cooling, and only 3% of the water is consumed. On the right side of the image, we present the potential use of water in the region. Water use in Chile is different than that observed in the United States. In the US, only 3% of the water used at thermoelectric facilities comes from the ocean, and 17% come from statuaries. Mitigating the environmental impact generated by withdrawing water with an overhead siphon requires a different approach than that used to some of the common intake structure found in the United States. A measure commonly used to reduce impeachment and entrainment is to install exclusion and collection technologies. The technologies installed in Chile are shown in the table. Recently, two new wet wire screens were installed uh, which would draw water from the Coronel Bay in the Pacific. So now we are going to see the, to explain the key impacts addressed uh, by the guide. Imagine a water body, a facility which will draw water from it. To protect the facility, a kind of grid or exclusion technology is installed. Some of the organisms, eggs and larvae, pass throughout the cooling water intake structure and into the cooling water system. That is entrainment. Entrainment of early life stage can pose a greater challenge due to the passive nature of eggs and larvae and due to the conservative assumption that mortality is 100% of all entrained organisms. Many regulators often put a greater emphasis on assessing the impact of entrainment. However, depending on the process for which the withdrawal flow is being used, cooling or desalination, there is potential for entrained organisms to survive. In steam electric generating facilities, entrainment survival has been demonstrated. According to the US EPA, Impeachment means the entrapment of any life stage of fish and shellfish on the outer part of the intake structure or against the screen device during periods of intake water withdrawal. Entrainment and impeachment definition have sense only associated with the specification of the screen's mesh size. The number of organisms lost due to entrainment and pigment is typically calculated based on field studies conducted at the intake. The field studies provide estimates of the number of organisms killed per unit of volume of intake flow. The US EPA defines several metrics to evaluate the performance of an intake system. For example, the number of individual fits lost per year or the number of adult equivalent losses per year, which uses entrainment losses to estimate the equivalent number of adult fish lost to the population. This figure shows the organisms by biological traits which drive the effect of impeachment and entrainment, such as the body length, the swing speed, thermal sensitivity, head capsule depth, of the larva, their population behaviors which influence the quantity of organisms in pink or in train, such as the number of organisms close to the intake, the presence of spawning areas, fish migration patterns, and others. The intake, the intake can be designed to minimize the effect of impeachment and entrainment by adjusting the facility's design parameters, such as reducing the intake velocity, approach or throw screen, selecting an adequate intake location, selecting the screen size and type, or reducing the volume of water withdrawal. Impeachment and entrainment are closely related to fish swimming ability. This graph developed by EPRI 
shows the swimming ability of different fish species. It has been shown that the majority of the majority has an average critical velocity greater than 15 centimeters per second. It's very important to note that this velocity is related to the concept of approach velocity, which is different than the concept of trout spin velocity. Later in this presentation, Donnie will provide some insights about both concepts. In passive screen protection systems, the morphological variation of larvae also affect the system performance. This graph, developed by HDR, shows the probability of entrainment versus the length of the larva for two different species. Organisms with greater cat capsule depth are excluded at shortened lengths. So we also, uh, we also studied the Chilean regulation context to assess systemic needs and find opportunities to align different objectives. As Carolina commented, we involved several stakeholders. We also identified the different and wide objectives that were stated in a complex normative structure. We identified metrics and processes and the interaction between stakeholders, strategic objectives, metrics, and processes defined by regulation. To do that, we used a system approach like the one used in the enterprise architecture class. Clearly, there was a lack of requirement definition regarding water withdrawal process and its potential environmental impact. One of the main challenges of the environmental regulation already defined by most countries is that they are conceived based on regulating emissions of pollutants. And clearly, environmental stress caused by impeachment and entrainment is not associated with the effects of pollutants. We also review different regulations defined in the US and Europe. Presently, in August 2014, after a multi-year long process, the US EPA defined the rule that establishes requirements for cooling water intake structures at existing facilities. The US EPA has been studying entrainment and impeachment impacts since the 70s. The section 316B aims to reduce impeachment and entrainment of fish and other aquatic organisms at the cooling water intake structure used by certain existing power generation and manufacturing facilities for the withdrawal of cooling water from the United States. It defines boundaries for its application. In Europe, we found the Water Framework direct Directive and other specific directives. The goal of the Water Framework Directive is to establish a framework for the protection of inline surface waters, transitional waters, coastal waters, and groundwater. It's not the object of this presentation to enter into the specific of this regulation. I only would like to highlight that in the United States, each a state, state can define particular procedures and requirements to apply the rules 316B. For example, regarding an entrainment impact assessment and cost benefits analysis of water intake alternatives. A similar approach is followed in, the, in Europe. The U.S. follow an interesting approach by regulating and defining requirements associated with the effects that the operator of the facility can manage. To reduce impeachment, the rule 316B prescribes seven alternatives. And to reduce entrainment, it requires that the director must establish the best technology available entrainment requirement for a facility on a site-specific basis. So, Donny. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, give me a second. I will try to set up the presentation from my end. We need to switch over. So now I'm sharing my screen.
There we go. You guys should be able to see my screen now. Well, thank you, Jorge and, and Caroline. I, I greatly appreciate it. So what I'm going to be discussing in this section is, as Carolina mentioned earlier, there were several studies that led to this guide. And I'm not going to go over all the details of these studies. They are publicly available. They could be downloaded through, downloaded through the Ministry of Energy's website. But what, what I will we'll do is I will highlight some of the interesting analysis and insights that we gathered during the guide definition process. And the first thing we had to do is basically understand the trade-offs between the different types of cooling systems. And this meant understanding the trade-offs from an environmental perspective, from an economic perspective. And, and what I show here uh, is the types of trade-offs that we did. And so we had to do the trade-offs for different types of cooling systems that were available in the market for different locations in Chile. And the reason you have to do it for different locations is because a cooling system and its configuration and its ultimate cost is greatly dependent upon environmental parameters such as ambient temperature or the temperature of water at the location where the water is being withdrawn. So for that, we selected four locations in Chile, which is Mejillones, Quintero, and Quillota, and Coronel. And these are the locations where most thermal electric facilities are located in Chile. And so here in this uh, graph, uh, which has a lot of information, uh, we showed the trade-off, because the trade-off is complex, of the total investment cost between the different types of cooling systems at the different locations we selected in Chile. And what you can see in this analysis is clear that the installed cooling component, the air cool condenser, or a dry system, is the most expensive, while the once through cooling system is the least expensive for our particular locations. Whenever you're looking at a dry cooling system, you're looking at a price of between $45 million and $62 million. But there's other costs. But in the total cost analysis, the cheapest option or the cheapest investment cost is associated with a once through cooling system in Chile, the most expensive, the air cool condenser. And in between, you've got cooling towers or closed loop cooling systems and uh, the cooling pond as well. So one thing that we had to do is we had to think about uh, in this analysis, well, you know, most of the cooling the cooling systems installed in Chile, like Jorge mentioned, are once through cooling systems. So we had to think about what if we were to replace a once through cooling system with closed loop cooling systems in Chile. So we performed an analysis again for some of the locations where most of the thermoelectric facilities are located uh, using some of the design parameters that are specific to the, those locations, such as ambient temperature and the wall wet bulb temperature uh, and the dry bulb temperature, uh, relative humidity, which they, they impact the, the cooling system. And uh, what we found is that if we were to convert all facilities in Chile that have a once through cooling system with a closed loop cooling system, you would see a, a significant power loss in these facilities. And basically what that would mean is that you would have a thermoelectric facility which is significantly costlier, costlier in terms of performance, operation, and ultimately the cost of electricity. So our analysis, and, and, and there's a lot more analysis in these studies, I just uh, highlighted some examples of what we did. But this led us to conclude that the once through cooling system with a properly designed intake, which minimizes adverse environmental impacts, is uh, the most adequate solution for all facilities located in the Chilean coast. And the reason this is, is because this allows for thermoelectric facilities to be more efficient. And this ends up reducing also some side effects, which are emissions. It, it ends up reducing uh, CO2 emissions and other types of emissions by having a more efficient thermoelectric facility, which is, which is important. Um, we also showed that if you properly design the intake, which minimizes adverse environmental impacts, you can get to 
reducing entrainment to a level that's can measuring measure it with having a close installing a closed loop cooling system or a cooling tower which is the approach that EPA used and we also determined and showed that the once through cooling system is the most cost effective solution in Chile so another thing we looked at um, is some of the 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 challenges with determining a velocity compliance point. And this is a picture that was provided to us by some marine biologists in, in Chile and divers, and they were conducting a test. This is not an, actually, an actual measurement system. Uh, it, it's not, it's just a prototype. And they were trying to see how to measure the through screen velocity at a particular location in Chile. And we didn't want to share, there's a video associated with this, but we didn't want to share it with you because of some of the challenges that we might have with the bandwidth or just making that happen in this presentation. But basically what the video shows is with this device is that because of the tidal effects in Chile at this particular facility, sometimes water flows into the system and sometimes water flows out of the system. So essentially at your through screen velocity compliance point, you would get positive velocities at some point and then negative velocities if you were to require somebody to measure the through screen velocity, which presents a, a challenge. Essentially also, uh, this screen you know, has very, it's, it's, it has very wide openings, but imagine a screen that has a two millimeter opening and that would also present some other challenges in measuring the through screen velocity. So in, in our study, we, we did a lot of analysis of all the work that led to the definition of the 316B in the US. And what we found that was quite interesting is that in the studies leading up to the definition of the 316B, most studies recommended using an approach velocity rather than a through screen velocity in the definition of a compliance point. And for some reason, in the end, when the regulation was defined, they adopted a through screen velocity. But based on our analysis and what, the, what we, some of the prob problems that we observed in Chile, we decided that having an approach velocity as the compliance point would be the most adequate solution for any guideline or regulation determined for Chile. And basically one of the, one of the key aspects of an approach velocity is that it is the velocity that makes the most sense from a biological point of view because it's the point at which an organism can swim away from the intake. So now, after giving you some insights, it's not the, all the insights, I'm, I'm not gonna go into everything because we, we did a lot of work and you can download those reports. Um, I will go more into the details and highlight some of the best practices which we presented to reduce the impact associated with water use at thermoelectric facilities in Chile. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna give you all the recommendations because there's not enough time. You can also download the guide. It's available through the Ministry of Energy's uh, website as well. So the first best practice to reduce the impact associated with water use at thermoelectric facilities is to promote, promote more efficient thermoelectric facilities. And what's the reason for that? As you can see in this picture, for both a cool coal unit and a natural gas combined cycle unit, you need a lot of water to, for the cooling system and to dissipate the heat associated with the facility. So if you have, independent of the fuel that, that you use, if you have a more efficient facility, then you're gonna require less water, which means less environmental impact. So promoting that makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, a best practice. The second best practice that we define is extremely important. Uh, like, like Jorge said, for one through cooling system and closed loop cooling systems or cooling towers, you need to withdraw significant amounts of water from a water body. So one thing that you can do is you can adequately select the water intake location. So one of the things that we did is we presented some guidelines of how to conduct a study which can show if the 
if an intake withdrawal location is adequate or not, or how to justify that. And that is in, in Annex 12 of the second study we performed from the Ministry of Energy. Another important thing to consider for selecting an intake location is if the intake location is near or spawn, spawning area. So you definitely want to stay away from spawning areas. It, it is better to select a location that is far away from a spawning area. So you, you, it's important to perform that type of analysis. Similarly, it is important to also select a location where there's less individuals near, near the intake rather than a location where there's more individuals near the intake. It is important also to consider if the intake location in intersects with a migratory route for a specific species, especially those of high value uh, to the ecosystem or to that particular location. And also, it is important to define and determine if the intake location significantly affects the life cycle of a valuable species. One thing that was happening in Chile is was that the thermocline was being used as a determination of the depth to, or as a parameter to determine the depth of the withdrawal location. And what we define in this guide and we recommend is not using the thermocline as, as an indicator of how deep uh, this intake uh, should be, but rather to conduct an analysis of the water body at that specific location and it determine an adequate depth for that location. And uh, there's, there's some information in, in, in the studies that we conducted to for the Ministry of Energy on how to conduct that. It is also important to be friendly to the divers. Well, why do you want to be friendly to the divers? Well, because if you put an intake in the ocean, you're, the, the intake might have to be maintained and repaired. So if you select a depth higher than 15 meters, then it makes it more difficult for divers to maintain and repair that intake. So we also make that recommendation as a best practice to consider that. Another thing that one can do um, to reduce the impact associated with water use at thermoelectric facilities is select the proper cooling system. So as, as I had showed you, uh, we, we determined that the preferred option for the Chilean coast is a one-through cooling system. But it is important that this one-through cooling system has a properly designed, operated, and maintained water intake and discharge system. That is extremely important. And also that it has a water intake system which minimizes adverse environmental impacts as well. And I'm going to show you a little bit more of how to do that in, in, in some of our next recommendations. You can use a closed loop cooling system when the altitude at which at where the location of the facility is makes it inefficient to pump water, the pump the water required by a one through cooling system. So what can happen in the Chilean coast is that you have drastic changes in altitude. So in, in some locations, it might make sense uh, to install the closed loop cooling system because of the, the, the altitude changes. And then if you're going to use a dry cooling system, use it in areas where there is water scarcity. It, 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 it might make sense there inland. Uh, but even even then, uh, if you have any access to sustainable water use, uh, it probably makes more sense to use a closed loop cooling system or a cooling tower. So another recommendation or best practice that we made was to operate a water uh, intake system with a maximum intake velocity of 15 centimeters per second and to reduce the effect that Jorge talked about, which is impingement or the fish getting stuck on the screen. The design intake velocity can be estimated at a distance which is less than eight centimeters away from the intake screen. So we basically adopted the approach velocity rather than the through screen velocity. And one thing that is important is, is that, the comply, it, it, that you can comply with this guide using the design intake velocity, not necessarily the measured intake velocity. So that's another important aspect of this recommendation. But 
There's other ways to do this. Uh, one can operate a water intake system with a maximum average velocity and show that of 15 centimeters per second. So there are several ways that one can use technology to properly design an intake which minimizes adverse environmental impacts. And so one way to do this is to use wedge wire, wire screens at the intake. And you can see here a picture of the cylindrical wedge wire screens. And this has a, a screen. And what we decide, you know, we did not want to prescribe the screen size opening uh, because that is something that needs to do be done depending on locations. On some locations where, you know, if it's determined that there is a lot of uh, biological activity, uh, a smaller screen might be required. But to do that, uh, one must perform uh, an entrainment uh, study. And, and we provide uh, those guidelines in, in, in the studies uh, leading up to, to the guide. One can also use a traveling screen. And also, for that screen size, it is important to consider the location, same as a wedge wire screen. But what is important is to have a, wedge a traveling screen with a fish return system. So the organisms can be returned safely back into the ocean. Another way that one can be environmentally friendly is to use a velocity cap. But it is important to consider the adequate design definition of a velocity cap, which has been lost in a lot of projects that have been defined or been submitted for approval across the world. And one very important parameter to consider is that a velocity cap is designed actually to have a higher velocity at the intake, and that, that's important. And the way this is achieved is by having a, a riser lip that is 1.5 times the height of the opening where the flow goes in. And the reason you've got that, that higher velocity is because that creates an effect where whenever fish swim, swim by the velocity cap, they, they sense that velocity and they, they move away from the velocity cap. And that's how it, it, was, it was intentionally designed. There's other options. There's other types of traveling screens, and those are also uh, presented as part of the, of the guide. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing uh, with the fisheries and, and, and wildlife division here uh, in Chile, or uh, Subsecretaria de Pesca. And so we're working on a guide with different methods to assess intake impacts. And, and the reason it is important to do this is basically whenever you pick the different types of technologies to mitigate impact, you need to have a way to compare these technologies and to be able to do a cost-benefit analysis. And so what we show in this figure is a figure uh, that was developed by the EPRI. And there's different ways to assess intake impacts. And some methods are more complex and some are less complex than others. Some are more focused on the population and some are most focused on the individual. What we are working on with Supesca is we're working on uh, methods, but primarily focus on the equivalent adult losses, which is measuring the impact associated with uh, individuals, not necessarily populations, which is similar to the direction that the EPA took after very doing a lot of work in, 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 in developing uh, these, these methods. So what we're, we're working is uh, on determining these guides, and uh, hopefully this guide will be available publicly uh, within this year. So finally, the most important part is that we, we really couldn't have done this alone. So there was a lot of people that, that were involved that collaborated with us. There was, uh, you know, an independent contractor and also MIT alum, Car Carl Basuto. He's an expert in thermoelectric facilities. Uh, we also had an, a lot of support from a marine biologist that had uh, worked with a lot of these issues in the U.S. Uh, called Tim Hogan, uh, and he supported us a lot uh, in this project. Uh, we got support from from different institutions, uh, Alden Labs. I think they they're located in in Massachusetts. Uh, then a, a, a group of local uh, 
a marine biologist called uh, Costa Sur as well. Uh, and we had support from also another uh, en engineering firm in the US that has a lot of experience working with the 316B, which is uh, HDR as well. And you know, finally, we, we had uh, very close collaboration with the Ministry of Energy and the Subsecretaria de Pesca, and we wanted to thank them, and we're, we're, we've, we've worked directly with them and collaborated with them in the different studies that we have performed. And finally, we'd like to thank the MIT SDM program for always letting us uh, present uh, these types of projects uh, through this webinar. So with that, I will open it up for questions, but before, uh, if you are really eager <laughs> to get a copy of this guide, it is available through this link. Uh, it's actually, um, it's, uh, it's, it's very nice in terms of the, the, the aesthetic design. Uh, so that's one thing that, that you will like. Uh, and it's short and, uh, you know, uh, it's in Spanish. That's the only thing that, that, that it, it's not available in English. So if, if you're looking for something like that, that, it's not available, but it is in Spanish. With that, I'll, I'll leave it up to Lois to moderate the questions. Okay. Thank you, Carolina and Jorge and Johnny. Uh, we have several questions that have come in. Um, First one uh, came from um, somebody who was just listening, not watching. He wants to know, can these best practices be applied to other sectors and industries which withdraw water from water bodies, such as desalination and mining operations? Well, I'll take that question. Jorge, Carolina, feel free to compliment uh, if you, if you want to jump in. But yes, some of, some of, especially uh, there's some other practices in the guide that we didn't go into too many details, which are associated with the discharge of thermal electric facilities. But in terms of some of the recommendations with withdrawing water from a water body for an industrial use, yes. Uh, and you know there is a lot of work, for example, that's happening in California. Uh, because they're installing desalination facilities to look at how the 316B can be used for that particular use. And the thing is, whenever you're withdrawing water from a water body, you will have similar issues that if you were withdrawing water for a thermoelectric facility, if you're withdrawing water for other industrial processes. What will be the, what is the difference fundamentally uh, between the different industrial uses is the amount of water that is that is used. So let's, you know, for example, you know, if you have a nuclear facility that will use a lot of water, it's like, you know, the equivalent of five Chilean power plants uh, or coal plants working uh, together. And, and that's the amount of water that, that you will use. A desalination facility will use less will we'll tend to use less water depending on the site uh, will tend to use less water so also for a desalination facility you know you will have other considerations in terms of the intake technologies that you will want to use uh, because of the smaller amounts of water that you're using you can do other things that are feasible and also because you're looking for essentially better water quality. So it is important to how deep you would draw the water is, is very important because you tend to get better water qu quality, but the water is cooler. So then that affects the efficiency of the desalination facility. So there's a trade off there that is, that, that is important. Uh, but the answer is yes, uh, there's, there's, some, there's some practices, but there's other things that need to be considered uh, for the different uh, industries. And, and I think uh, a lot of people around the world are looking at this because uh, desalination, especially water use in industry, like in, in industries like mining and desalination is becoming more important. So they're, they're thinking about, okay, all the work that's been done uh, for thermoelectric facilities, which is significant water user, uh, water user, then how can that be used for other industries? Thank you. 
the next question is, are there renewable energy sources with similar water needs? And Donnie, just one note, it seems we seem here in the States to be getting some um, uh, noise behind your mic. And I'm just wondering if, if it's possible for you to move your microphone just a little bit away from your face, your mouth. Okay, maybe that is that is better. Let me here. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll move it away a little bit. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, so um I I mean I, I can take this one again, Jorge, you can or you want to take a shot at it. No, 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 okay. Just a... Okay. Okay. Um so yes, there are renewable so like Jorge said, uh the fuel type really doesn't matter. Um, whenever you have, you know, you can, for example, a, a CSP plant also acts similarly as a thermoelectric uh, facility. It uses sun as its fuel, but it has important water requirements um, to keep uh, the back pressure of the turbine specifically. And so in whenever there's um, CSP plants that have been installed, you got to consider a cooling system and depends on the location you know you can have a, 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 a close cycle cooling system or you can have a, if, if you're in a very dry location then you can have also or you don't have any water access you can have an air cool condenser or a dry cooling system but yes it, it is I mean a, a, a CSP plant works very similarly than a thermoelectric facility it just uses the sun uh, to create, uh, to heat up that steam and put it through that same, through that same cycle. The other instances where it's being used as well and, and where there's a similar issue is, for example, uh, in, in, in Chile specifically, there's some very innovative projects related to withdrawing water from the ocean to have, to pump it up uh, certain because in, in Chile you get significant variations of uh, elevation in some places in the coast and so basically some people are experimenting with pump storage from the ocean and there I mean you're you're basically it's a storage technology and you're withdrawing large amounts of water from the ocean and uh, storing it at a location uh, upstream uh, and then putting back that water in, 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 in into the ocean and taking it out to have uh, the capacity to, to store energy. So yes, I mean, this problem applies not only to fossil fuel-based facilities, but also some renewable and storage uh, facilities as well. Uh, re, uh, you know, you can call them renewable or sustainable storage facilities as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the next, uh, actually, the next uh, question is preceded by a comment. Great presentation, very informative, thanks. Now the question is, are there any cases in Chile where thermal power plants were shut down because of the inaccessibility of cooling water, whether fresh water or seawater? Jorge, I feel like I've I've talked a lot. Why don't you take this one? <laughs> I I would say that not yet, because uh, we, we we have so most of the power plants are located okay uh, by the coast, but some power plants that are located in the central region, especially in Quillota, and that uh, we draw water from water wells during the last couple of years have had significant challenges with water availability in the region. So the operators uh, have been very innovative in how they supply water to those kind of facilities, in, especially in, 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 in the region of Kyoto. Okay. I'll complement that a little bit, but what we did I mean, what Carolina showed in one of her, her slides uh, was that there was some issues where, where a facility was shut down because of uh, some, some issues with 
the environmental impacts it was having on that specific location and some social unrest around that specific facility. Uh, the other thing that, 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 that you know, we have seen is that it is, it is difficult to get a permit for water use. And so in order to avoid that, sometimes developers are trying or they're opting for dry cooling systems in, in terms of what we've seen in some environmental impact statements where it, it doesn't necessarily, it, it's not the most optimal uh, option, but they're, they're choosing that because it's hard to get uh, that permit and have access uh, uh, to water. So some of that uh, we, we, have, we have specifically uh, seen. Hi, sorry about that. The next question reads, uh, how can a guide like this address some of the social and institutional issues associated with withdrawing water from water bodies? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that, Jorge. Maybe you can compliment a little bit, or Carolina. Um, so, I mean, w one way, so one of the challenges that we uncovered whenever we were uh, performing these studies and uh, developing the guide is that if, if you don't have a proper definition, that creates tension between stakeholders in society, the institutions providing the permits, and the developers, because there isn't something that they can go to and say, hey, this is the best practice or this is the best way to do things to minimize environmental impact that is not based on opinion, but basically based on facts and saying, hey, this is the best solution that we have. And what we have to try to figure out is how to get to that best solution. And that creates tension from all sides because you know, some myths start to get developed and, you know, and perceptions start taking over rather than the facts themselves. And, and that is very important. And, and so a guide like this or re properly defined regulation can help do that. It can help create a, a framework that can be used and that is fact-based to help people uh, uh, understand what is best for that particular location. The key is, which is very important, is defining regulation that is clear, that is, you know, it considers the right trade-offs in its definition uh, or, or, right, or, or guidelines that do that and, and that are clear to the different stakeholders. Because if you don't do that, it could actually make the problem worse in a sense. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what we found in, 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 in our study and essentially doing that work to define those things really helps calm those, that situation and it gives the, the different types of stakeholders some, something to go by and basically trust and have that they can help them have better discussions on what is the best option and that's what you want to really be getting at, is really having uh, everybody work towards uh, defining the best alternative. And by that is, is an alternative that is, uh, you know, feasible in, in that particular location, but also in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cost effective way can uh, minimize the impact and focuses on, on the biggest impact in that particular location. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's the, uh, that's, we're out of time right now, but um, Johnny or Jorge, would you like to give out um, an email address or a website where people can, oh. is there an email uh, website address or, or yes. an email uh, address? Yes. Uh, so, 
you guys can go uh, to our website, which is www.inodoo.com. And, uh, you know, an email address where you can reach us is Donnie, D-O-N-N-Y, at inodoo.com if, if you need to, to reach us. I don't know right. if we, put, we didn't put the email on the, on the presentation, um, but yeah. <laughs> no problem. Um, I um, do have a list of all of the questions that were asked. Um, I will send that to the presenters. And um, when you receive the link to the recording and the slides, which will be posted within a week, I will include contact info for uh, Johnny and um, Jorge. Thank you very much for attend attending. Um, the next webinar will be held on May 22nd, and it's about technology platforms. The speakers are from the travel industry, so lots of complexity there. And then we'll be taking a break for the summer. You'll, you will receive information on the upcoming May 22nd webinar as well. Carolina, Donnie, Jorge, thank you for a really interesting presentation. And to all of you, thanks for attending and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.